8. Baba leaves the house early every evening before his shift begins. After his DUI, his boss at Dyer Plastic fired him. He started a new job at a gas station owned by a wealthy Palestinian immigrant who knows his friend Amjad. It's menial and less money, but Baba is happy to take it. As with every other hardship, he doesn't complain. He prays at home every evening, facing the eastern corner of the family room after a washing ritual in the bathroom. Afaf stands in the hallway, watching her father, his back to her. He lays out a red velvet rug with a palatial mosque woven in the middle, minarets in golden thread. She wonders where he got the rug. His body folds over in prostration, then he lowers himself to the floor, legs tucked underneath him. When Baba pulls himself up, she hears a slight <clears throat> and she too bears the pain of his lower back. She quietly escapes into her room before he's finished. Summer is almost over. Baba is busy with a new group of men, the organizers of the Islamic Center of Greater Chicago. They want to build a mosque to replace the old civic center on 63rd and Kedsey Avenue, a dilapidated gathering place where mostly men congregate to pray on, to pray on Fridays and during Eid. The women host Ramadan potlucks and run childcare during the day. They have found a plot of land outside the city, off Interstate 55, in a small town called Tempest, and have begun petitioning for it. Baba's religious awakening rattles Afaf. It's a new side of her father that she can't quite understand. She's happy he quit his drinking and devotes himself to recovery, but it's like he stumbled upon a spring of water and he wants them all to drink from it. She's uncertain if it's safe and hangs back. She can tell it makes Majid nervous, too. Her brother remains guarded toward their father, as though he's walking on a bridge that might collapse at any moment. Do you know how many churches there are in the state of Illinois? Baba rails one night. A thousand. And how many Buddhist temples and synagogues? Ten. 20. He pumps his hands in the air like he's counting for a child, stressing the immensity of this fact. And how many masjids are there? Huh? Afaf has heard about the mosque Khati Nasrin's husband drives 45 minutes to attend in Milwaukee every Friday. It was founded by a group of men exiled from Yemen in 1979. Wahid. Baba points his long finger in their faces. One, we too have the right to gather together and pray. It's our human right. Afaf's family hasn't observed Islam beyond small celebrations of Eid with Khalti Nasreen. Mama reluctantly puts on a dress and they drive the hour and a half to Kenosha. It's a religion she knows very little about one limited to notions of what's haram and aib, gambling, drinking alcohol, premarital sex. She remembers a painting hanging in Samira's house of an old man carrying an ancient city on his back, a gold-domed mosque towering over stone houses with orange tile roofs. Afaf would stare at it for a long time, imagining the old man was the god of Arabs, who'd carried and protected her parents and sisters, eternally carrying his burden. He was an unadorned figure, barefoot and wearing a turban. As she grew older, the old man faded from consciousness and another kind of god emerged, a far away ominous being with whom you reckoned when you, when you died. Like the one who commands Moses in the movie that played every Easter Sunday night. She never prayed to either god, not even when her sister disappeared. Majid smiles at their father's magnanimous decree. What are you laughing at? Baba snaps. Nothing. It's just that... Majid looks at Afaf, but she keeps quiet. She too is unsure how to react. It seems like a dream, Baba. Yes, yes. 
Baba concedes. It is a dream, Habibi, one that will come true if we all, if we all have faith. Say, Inshallah. Inshallah, Afaf says. It's such a simple word that seems full of promise, yet without the pressure of failure. A word conceding to a power that might ultimately decide all of their fates, lifting the burden from themselves. Majid is silent. Baba says it again. Inshallah. The TV volume in her parents' bedroom lowers. Mama is listening. The spell between her and Baba has broken since her father started talking to them about the Prophet Muhammad, an illiterate shepherd, and how Allah had revealed his word through texts Muhammad could miraculously read and spread to the community. Afaf can't understand it. Baba seems to want to improve himself, and Mama berates him for it. The Lord has given us a purpose in this life. To pray, to fast, to take care of the poor, to fulfill Hajj, and above all, to believe in his beneficence, that he is the only God, and that Muhammad is his true prophet. Afaf thinks of the evangelical preachers on TV, the only programming at 1 a.m. when Baba's at work and she's battling a fit of insomnia. The prophet says, Worship God as though you see him. But if you do not see him, know that he sees you. Baba sounds so sincere, his face light and airy, the wrinkles across his forehead dissolving a bit. It is never too late. Mama suddenly looms in his doorway, a shadow inside her darkened bedroom. Her hair is in a loose braid, gray strands threading it. She holds a cigarette like an actress in an old black and white film, the wicked woman who's about to foil a good-hearted plan. Then why has the Lord turned away from the suffering of Muslimina? Huh? Why has he forsaken the Palestinians? You think your precious masjid will make a difference? But Afaf sees in Mama's face the real question. Why has God taken Nada away from her? Afaf too wonders why. Baba smiles at Mama. This earth is temporary, ya muntaha. Allah has a plan and we must be patient and heed him. Our suffering is a temporary. Shall I tell you of better things than those earthly joys? For the God conscious there are, with their sustainer, gardens through which running waters flow. It's the first time Afaf hears her father quote the Quran. He knows the words to every Umm Khaltum song, memorized Nat King Cole's Mona Lisa. But he recites this verse as though the words are his own, summoning them from a deep well of serenity. It is a new song to learn. Faith has become his instrument. Mama sneers, sucking on her cigarette. All of it is hakifadi. To Mama, such words are like Velcro holding fast until you strip them away with, their, with your actions. She tosses her cigarette in the sink and it hisses. You can keep your foolish words. She retreats to the bedroom and the TV booms, drowning them out. Your mother has suffered greatly, but she will see how easy it is to cast off her suffering as soon as she opens her heart to the Lord. He pauses. Something sad flickers in his eyes. He resumes his sermon. And you, too, Lulat, I'll keep failing you as a father if I don't lead you on the lighted path. Afaf shifts in her chair, uncomfortable. How did they fit into all of this? She thinks about the boys whose hands have roamed her body and the resentment toward her parents that has rooted deep in her heart. Her bitterness toward an absent sister seizes like a tidal wave in her chest. 
I want you to come with me tonight to the masjid, Baba declares. I took the night off work for a special meeting. Young people will be there too. Every hand, big and small, must lay down a brick. It's your future we're building today. It sounds like Baba's reciting from a salesman's script, but each word is doused in, in sincerity. Still, Afaf can't fathom any day beyond tomorrow. She'll be starting a new job at Pine Forest Mall in a kiosk that duplicates keys. She'd quit two others since her graduation. Graduation was an event that extracted nothing more than a few awkward hugs from Baba and Majid and a strained dinner afterward at Leo's Steakhouse, where other small parties of families were celebrating their children's diplomas, bouquets of balloons floating above their tables. Mama had pretended to be sick. She'd given Afaf an envelope with thirty dollars. What do you say? Baba says, his bright eyes imploring her and Majid. Afaf nudges her brother with her eyes. Okay, her brother says, glancing at Mama's closed door. Nine. An hour later, Baba pulls up to a furniture storefront of the building, a sign blinking though it's closed for the evening. On a security door, there's a small sign indecipherable from the street. The Islamic Center of Greater Chicago. Welcome. Rain drips from the eaves of the roof. A woman pushes a grocery cart past, past, her translucent haircut glistening. Here we are, Baba announces, beaming at them. Afaf remembers this place. She and Majid have been here before, perhaps a decade ago, before Nada disappeared. Mama had dressed them up for gatherings when her parents still socialized. Snapshots flicker in her mind as Afaf gazes up at the building. Baba playing his oud while the Arabi men sang old folk songs and danced the dabka. She can still hear the lamentation in their voices and aching for a stolen homeland, their bilad, a country she's only seen in old photographs and heard about in stories Mama and Khalti Nasreen recollect over Qahwa. Baba climbs out and walks quickly around the front of the car, winking at Afaf. His back ache seems to have temporarily disappeared. Afaf looks over the passenger seat at Majid. He reluctantly slides out and stands beside Baba. They wait for her their chins tucked into their chests against the cold rain. Afaf taps the door handle of Baba's replacement car, a black Toyota Camry. The men inside the center had collected enough money for a small down payment and one of them had co-signed on condition that Baba make the monthly payment without fail. They would repossess the car if he drank again. This new group of Muslimin, gas station owners, dentists, mechanics, and the retired had embraced her father, given him a chance. And here they are, Afaf and Majid, his children, about to enter their community. Afaf hasn't belonged to any place. Samira and the other Arabiyat flash across her mind. The taste of rejection is sharp on her tongue. Still, she climbs out of the car, and Baba squeezes her shoulder. The older Muslimat immediately flock around Afaf. They hug and kiss both of her cheeks, smoothing her hair, squeezing her shoulders. How lovely you are, mashallah! I think I see a bit of Abu Majid in that face. Afaf nods and smiles, her cheeks hot in response to their effusive attention pouring on her all, all at once. They usher her to the side where the women congregate. It's not so different from the Arabi kids at school, men on one side, women on the other. The children find a space in between. Majid and Baba are welcomed by a heavy-set man, the Imam, with a long gray beard and Afaf hears her brother plunged into the same gushing affection. 
A few of the women wear headscarves, loose fitting around their faces, strands of dark hair that have strayed from the fabric. She thinks of Mama and Khalti Nasreen, how they wouldn't be caught dead in a headscarf. There is a black woman with a daughter Afaf's age. They both wear turbans, green and orange, their faces shiny. A few prayer rugs like the one Baba brought home hang a t- tapestries on, the wa- on one wall. A large woman shaped like a bell waddles over to Afaf, chubby arms is outstretched in her abaya. Ya Habibti, come, come. We're so happy you're here. She passes Afaf to her heavy bosom. She presses Afaf to her heavy bosom and Afaf smells lilac and sweat. Why haven't you come sooner? She is called Umm Zureb, though she doesn't have any children. Afaf finds out later she's been widowed since her early 20s, never remarried. It's rumored her husband was among the Palestinian liberation fighters who fought and perished in the Battle of Karama. Come, meet the other Banat. The girls smile at Afaf and introduce themselves. The only one she recognizes is Kokab, Suleiman. She's the only young person Afaf has seen wearing a headscarf at school. Not loose and fashionable, but snug around her face, her neck disappearing beneath the folds of her scarf. If that had not been sufficient reason for others to torment her at Hoover, Kokab's name clinched it. Freshman year, Afaf's English class was assigned to tell the origin of their names. Kokab had stood quietly in front in front of rows of lanky, pimply white boys and stuck-up girls and announced, Planet. Your name means planet, the teacher repeated. Like your anus? One of the white boys had called out. The class descended into laughter. Afaf watched the co-cab slip a finger inside her headscarf as though tucking away an invisible strand of hair. She looked down at her desk. That's enough, the teacher warned. The awful nickname had stuck. Here comes your anus, the boys taunted. Kokab found notes on her desk with crudely drawn illustrations and immediately crumpled them up without reading them and stuffed them into her backpack. She'd settle into her desk, crack open her textbook, and stare straight ahead, her headscarf like horse blinders. The more blatant insults thinned out by the end of the year, but Afaf suspected Kokab found a glob of spit or chewed gum, chewed gum to the back of her headscarf on some days. Hi, Afaf says, sensing Kokab won't make the first move. Hi, Kokab smiles shyly at Afaf. She gestures to a table with trays of hummus and baba ghanoush. Freshly baked hummus is sliced in quarters. I think we had a class together sophomore year, Kokab says. Seems like forever. It was freshman year, English, Afaf tells her, following her. Oh yeah, Mr. Rylan. Kokab's eyes do not betray any humiliating memory. This girl had been the easier target. Afaf grew invisible to her classmates barbs a long time ago, her skin gradually hardening from the name calling and insults. Would you park your camel? You got oil in your backpack? She refused to cower. Had Kokab heard about her? Does this girl know how many hands have groped Afaf? She feels her cheeks flush with the fresh sting of Rami's slap across her face. Kokab's smile doesn't contain any judgment, more, more a guarded politeness like she's trying not to offend Afaf. They don't say any more and turn to observe the other girls for a while. There are a hodgepodge of ages, grade school age and teenagers, young and married, pregnant mothers, and a few wearing engagement rings. The older women hover like doting hens. 
Afaf doesn't notice anyone else from Hoover High School. It occurs to her that aside from Kokab, she is anonymous here. It suddenly feels like a chance to start over, the same as for Baba, maybe. People deserve second chances, right? Isn't that what Silas learns with the arrival of his golden-haired Effie? Isn't that what drew Afaf to her favorite books? Through near spirit breaking ordeals, the protagonists still overcome. It's what hope is after all. Baba found it after the car crash and now he wants to blanket her and Majid in its folds. For Baba, hope is religion, though it's more complicated shape to Afaf, as she knows so little about Islam. The Imam makes an announcement that she doesn't understand and suddenly everyone shifts from their places. Men roll out two massive Persian rugs, their fraying edges touching on the middle of the tiled floor. They are burgundy and forest green, giant flowers ador adorning the center, smaller ones tracing their perimeter. The women and girls move to a corner of the room where homemade prayer rugs prayer clothes hung on wooden knobs. Some of the shape, shapeless tops and bottoms are mismatched, simply stitched fabrics. The women quickly slip them on and suddenly their previous forms disappear. They look like Russian nesting dolls, their faces poking through the fabric, their hands peeking from under small tents. They quickly assemble in lines behind the men. Everyone faces the eastern wall, which has no windows. Kokab hands her a pair of prayer clothes. Afaf hesitates. Yalla, she encourages. It's time for Salat. Do you have wudu? Afaf nods, though she doesn't understand. It's easy to follow Kokab's orders, her tone, her tone kind yet insistent. Afaf slips the bottom over her jeans hitching the elastic band over her hips. She pokes her face through a hole in the material, and it hangs over her head and torso like a tent, billowing around her shoulders. Kokab gestures for Afaf to stand beside her. She, she searches for Baba and Majid and finds them in the second row of men and boys. Her brother turns around a few times, stealing glances until he finds Afaf and grins. How funny she must look. Just follow my moves, Koka whispers as the Imam begins the prayer. Allahu Akbar. She watches Koka in her peripheral vision, folding her hands across her stomach as Koka does. It's the same way Baba begins when Afaf watches him from the hallway. Subhanakallahumma. Everyone bends at their knees. Allahu Akbar. The blood rushes to Afaf's head for a second and she feels strangely vulnerable as she bows to some unforeseen presence that she imagines can, at its own whim, punish her in hellfire or gather her in its folds. Subhan Rabbul Azim wa bihamdi. Everyone pulls their bodies upright. Allahu Akbar. Then they're suddenly on the floor, their legs folded beneath them. Afaf watches Kokab touch her forehead to the rug and she hesitates, lifting her gaze to watch the others. The folded bodies look peaceful. Afaf touches the rug, her forehead at first bristling at the scratchy woven thread. She remembers to breathe. Allahu Akbar. They repeat this pattern three more times and conclude in the sitting position. Assalamu alaikum. Kokab says to a woman on the other side of her, then turns to Affaf. Assalamu alaikum. Kokab is like a proud teacher. Good job, Affaf. She pats Affaf's shoulder. You'll learn the words in no time if you keep doing it. Afaf feels like a stranger who's finally come home, one who's forgotten the language, 
the mannerisms of her people. She's nervous, tentative. Um Muzraib's words ring in her ears. Why haven't you come sooner?